Welcome friends. In this first video of the cam phaser series, I'm removing the intake, turbo inlets, charged air pipes, and the cooling hoses from around the engine so that I can get to the timing cover. I ordered most of the parts for the cam phaser repair from Lakeland Ford's online parts system. They were the quickest online resource that I could find that actually had all of the parts in stock and they shipped fairly quickly. I will put a few parts lists in the description based on what I replaced, one with the minimum replacement option that I would consider and one that kind of maxes out all of the preventative maintenance while you're doing this. It's important to inventory all of the parts prior to beginning the repair and identify any missing parts or duplicates that weren't needed. Lakeland Ford has a 30 day return policy with a 20% restocking charge and return shipping paid by the customer. Since the truck didn't fit in the garage, I plan to work on it with the front end only in the garage and then roll it out every evening and back in every morning. So I put the truck in neutral and turned off the e-brake, making sure to chalk the wheels. Then I popped the hood, cleaned up my working space, and fully removed the battery to have a safe working area with more room to move hoses around. The battery terminals require a 10 millimeter socket and the bracket bolt is seven millimeters. Next, I removed all three skid plates from the bottom of the truck using 10 millimeter, 13 millimeter, and 15 millimeter sockets with an impact wrench. I began draining the oil and noticed a decent leak that I'll talk about at the end of the video. Then I put my new Milwaukee underhood light on the truck and removed the oil filler cap to remove any vacuum while the oil was draining out. And also to inspect it for issues with my IAG air oil separator, which was still putting milkshake into my filler tube. Next, I drain the coolant from the radiator into a five gallon bucket using a hose and flathead screwdriver. When both were done draining, I capped them off then I removed the intake using an eight millimeter socket on the hose clamps and unclipping the sensor on the back of the intake. The stock box uses plastic clips on the filter side and eight millimeter hose clamps on the turbo inlet side. Next, I pulled off the engine cover using a 10 millimeter deep socket to remove the two nuts holding it on. And I moved on to the coolant reservoir using a 10 millimeter socket to remove two bolts holding it down as well as pliers to slide off the hose clamps and a small flathead screwdriver to unclip the lower hose. There are three hoses connected to it. One runs off the back to the thermostat, another runs off the passenger side to the radiator, and the third is underneath and it runs to the water pump. Next, I got to removing the PCV system off both valve covers, the intake manifold, the turbo inlet tubes, and the cool side charged air pipe running to the throttle body. These hoses are attached with connectors that you, you kind of squeeze on one side of the connector and then on the other side you use a flathead screwdriver to pull out the clip. If they've never been removed before, it can be very difficult to pull them off even with them like being fully unclipped. There is a sensor attached to the driver's side valve cover pipe and five total connections between the valve covers and the intake manifold. All of the extra hoses that you see here are for my air oil separator and it, it's so much more simple on the, on the stock system. This thing was also difficult to install in general. The driver's side turbo inlet has four connections on it with the lowest one obviously being the most difficult to remove. With the PCV hoses off, I could start to remove the turbo inlet and charged air pipes. First, I loosened both hose clamps on the turbo using a seven millimeter socket, long extension, and swivel joint. I tried to remove the inlet tube on the driver's side right after loosening the hoses, but the pin was stuck inside of the pin retainer bracket and it seemed impossible to remove. I even used an eight millimeter socket to remove the pin bracket from the valve cover, but couldn't get it to come apart. Silicone lubricant spray would have allowed the pipes to pop out very easily. 
So instead, I ended up loosening and removing the clamps from the charged air pipes on both sides, thinking that I could pull out both the inlet and the charged air pipes at the same time. In this video, you see that I have an aftermarket intercooler. If I had a stock one, I would definitely remove it to have more access from below. I, I do remove the stock intercooler in my very first video, the, uh, the intercooler install. Then I removed the cold side charged air pipe leading to the throttle body using a 10 millimeter socket on the hose clamp for this aftermarket pipe and also unclipping the sensor attached to the pipe. Pulling this out gave me room to get leverage on the pin retaining bracket and actually separate the inlet pipe from the bracket and from the charged air pipe because they're all clipped together. If you have a catch can or air oil separator installed above the charged air pipe, it will need to be removed in order to allow the pipe to turn while pulling it out. Uh, it's also really helpful to pull off the boot whenever you get it up there. Uh, I actually lost the video for this, so I, I don't have anything to show you here. On the passenger side, I loosened the hose clamps leading to and away from the turbo using a 7mm socket, long extension, and swivel joint. This time I could not reach the 8mm nuts holding on the pin retaining bracket, so I had to wrestle with the inlet pipe to get the pin out of the bracket, and then pop off some wire retaining clips and completely remove the inlet pipe before using an 8mm wrench to remove the pin retaining bracket. Uh, when I pulled that off, it gave me some room to pop off the plastic retaining clips, which hold the heater core hoses onto the pin retaining bracket, and I could finally pull out the charged air pipe. I unclipped the vacuum system hoses from the air box, and actually, eventually I just removed most of those hoses, disconnecting at the brake booster and the vacuum solenoid. I did this to get more space and eventually pull out the air box so I'd have more room when working on the cam phasers. I moved on to the rest of the coolant hoses, starting with the upper radiator hose, which connects to the thermostat housing. I used a large pair of adjustable pliers to slide off the clamps. The hose that tees into the bottom of the upper radiator hose is more challenging. It requires either a special tool or needle nose pliers on the upper portion of the clip to depress and unlock it. I ended up using a flathead to unlock each side individually and pull it out, and this took me over 15 minutes just for this one clip. Next was the heater core hoses and auxiliary water pump. The pump itself has a bracket which is bolted onto the timing cover with three 10mm bolts. The hose that runs to the thermostat is a standard clamp, and it, you know, at, th at this point I just started disconnecting stuff. Starting with the water pump hose, which has a Y connector, with one side running to the coolant expansion tank, and the other running to the coolant control valve. Then I disconnected the lower radiator hose from the thermostat housing, and the hose that runs to the thermostat housing down to the auxiliary transmission oil cooler, mounted to the frame crossmember. With those unclipped, I could move the auxiliary pump and hoses over to the battery tray, up and out of the way. To finish removing the lower radiator hose, I removed the clamps from the engine oil cooler and pulled off the hoses before spending 20 minutes trying to pull off the radiator connector. This is held on by a wire clip, but the connection's o-ring is very tight and it's difficult to remove. Uh, later on, I learned it's extremely difficult to install also. Alright, so final thoughts are that this took much longer than expected. The end of this video is about six hours into my first day. Of course, I, I ate lunch, I set up the camera, did recordings, I did research, and I took my time. I did buy a 72-hour pass to the Ford Workshop Manual, and I'll add the link in the description. 
this was, it was helpful, but it was not as helpful as I thought. Um, it helped here and there, but there's, there's no like quote cam phaser complete instructions. You have to pull all the various instructions and use what you need from each of them. I relied heavily on the engine removal and installation with body on, as well as the engine disassembly and assembly instructions. Then you need to go into each part individually to get all of the information, uh, including updated information that only changed in that individual instructional part. Uh, I didn't show it in this video, but I did stick colored microfiber towels anywhere that I didn't want debris or rodents getting into, especially the turbos and coolant passages. I also learned that the AIG air oil separator sucks, at least in the Pacific Northwest. Even after I did the proper bleeding procedure, which was not outlined in the instructions, it still ended up mixing water and oil and dumping that into my engine. I apologize that this is a four-part series. My cover story is that, you know, this way more info is easily accessible, but really I just, I just don't have the time to edit six days worth of video in a single weekend. Yes, it took five and a half days to finish the cam phaser repair, but I also upgraded some parts and I, I did take an additional two days to troubleshoot an issue with one of the upgrades that I did. So the total was actually eight days until it was fixed 100%. I took a week off of work to do this. So if you're meticulous, uh, give yourself time. That's all I got for this video. Part two will be the valve and timing covers. Part three is the actual timing component removal and installation. And part four is the reassembly. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.